Hello. It's good to see you all again for our Wednesday evening prayer time. I'm recording this from not so sunny Florida. We're here on a family vacation, my wife, my two daughters, my two sons-in-law, and four grandchildren. We really are having a wonderful time. It's been very relaxing. We miss you all very much. As you know, we've been studying Philippians. We're now at the final midweek message from chapter two of Philippians, and it's the final message in which we introduced ourselves to our good friend, Epaphroditus. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Philippians chapter two, and we'll be reading eventually verses 25 through 30. And this week, we're going to look at those verses from the ESV, the English Standard Version. We have a nation that doesn't place much emphasis on honor. We're not teaching our kids to honor adults, and we are dishonoring our marriage vows, and we're not showing honor to those to whom the scripture says honor is due. In the military, the highest award that can be given for meritorious valor is the Medal of Honor, sometimes mistakenly called the Congressional Medal of Honor. I went online to find who are the recipients of this great award, this great um, recognition for gallantry in the time of war. And you can find websites that will give you the names of all the recipients of the Medal of Honor, and it will give you a citation for each of them. I picked at random Carlton W. Barrett from World War II. The citation says this, rank and organization, private, U.S. Army, 18th Infantry, 1st Infantry Division, place and date, near Saint-Laurent-sur-Mer, France, 6 June 1944. Citation, for gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty on 6 of June 1944, in the vicinity of Saint-Laurent-sur-Mer, France. On the morning of D-Day, Private Barrett, landing in the face of extremely heavy enemy fire, was forced to wade ashore through neck-deep water. Disregarding the personal danger, he returned to the surf again and again to assist his floundering comrades and save them from drowning. Refusing to remain pinned down by the intense barrage of small arms and mortar fire poured at the landing points, Private Barrett, working with fierce determination, saved many lives by carrying casualties to an evacuation boat lying offshore. In addition to his assigned mission as guide, he carried dispatches the length and fire-swept breadth of the beach. He assisted the wounded. He calmed the shocked. He arose as a leader in the stress of the occasion. His coolness and his dauntless daring courage, while constantly risking his life during a period of many hours, had an inestimable effect on his comrades and is in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Army. And so he was awarded the Medal of Honor. In a sense, that's what happened with Epaphroditus because he went above and beyond the call of duty. The Apostle Paul is, in essence, granting him a medal of honor. We see that in verses 25 through 30. Let's read them again. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Honor is a very important term in both the Old and the New Testaments. But what exactly is honor from a biblical perspective? William Barclay gives us a helpful, 
helpful definition. The biblical words, often translated as honor, can have a number of shades of meaning. As a baseline definition, to honor means to esteem and treat another with respect because of who they are or what they have done. Honor has the sense of value, price, or quality. That which is valued and esteemed is honored. The biblical use sometimes also means to seek to enhance the reputation of someone. Now, we could also note that honor is often a communal bestowment. It is communal in nature. Typically, in the scriptures, honor is bestowed by, on someone by a community. It is a public declaration that a person's actions are worthy of commendation. And so Paul is telling the Philippian church, when Epaphroditus comes back, you publicly, as an aggregate, as a family, honor him and honor such men. Bestowing honor on those who are deserving of it is indeed a biblical activity. Kevin D. Gardner notes, to fail to honor those around us, whether superiors, inferiors, or equals, is to engage in rebellion against God, especially in the case of our superiors. Casting off earthly authorities is tantamount to casting off our heavenly authority, the one who placed those earthly authorities over us. This is why rebellion against parents was such a grievous sin under the Old Covenant, and why Paul included disobedience to parents as among the grave offenses committed by the ungodly. He goes on to say, As God is due honor by virtue of his being our God, so our fellow man is due honor by virtue of his being God's image bearer. And so also, our superiors are due honor by virtue of their having authority by God's ordinance. When we honor our fellow men in their several relations, we honor the God who placed us all where we are. So let's take a look at this concept of honor very briefly in our time together. The Bible commands us to honor certain people. There are multiple examples we could cite. But let's just pick a few. Obviously, most importantly, we're to honor God. That is culminated in Revelation 4, verse 11, which says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of you, your will, they existed and were created. So notice, you're worthy, O Lord, and you are to receive honor and power and glory. How does God receive honor? He can't take more honor upon himself than he already possesses because he's infinite and he's perfect. It's talking about the fact that God is deserving to receive our honor and praise. We publicly honor God by ascribing to him that which he is and testifying to that which he has done. We're also to honor our parents. You're to honor your father and your mother. Obviously, this is from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. But it's reiterated by the Lord Jesus Christ on multiple occasions. And the Apostle Paul uses this in his admonition to the Ephesian church about children obeying their parents in the Lord and declaring that it's the first commandment with a promise. We are to honor our parents. The scripture indicates we're to honor the elderly. Leviticus 19.32 says, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Let's take a look at that just for a moment in this concept of honor. First of all, the scripture there in Leviticus is part of the Old Testament law, but certainly reiterated in other places in the New Testament, says you stand up before the gray head and you honor the face of an old man, which led to the tradition in Western culture and certain Eastern cultures. When an older person enters a room, you're supposed to stand up. You show respect for them because of their age. But notice how God puts it. Having done that, you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So in essence, Failure to honor older people is failure to honor God as Lord. This is why it's such a grievous sin. We were at a kind of an open air uh, food court type restaurant last night. We were trying to be socially distanced, wearing our masks when not eating, 
and the people were pretty well spread out and there were fans going. We felt reasonably comfortable being there. But there was kind of an extended family and they had several small children. And I thought it was bit somewhat odd and to a certain extent vexing. These children were allowed to play on the floor, which wasn't very clean. And they were allowed to rough house on the floor, but the problem was they were playing on the floor and rough housing and playing with small cars so that older people couldn't get by them. You almost had to trip over this child to get where he was going. And I thought to myself, this family thinks they're being, you know, modern, somewhat cool, and they're going to let their children be kids. But at the same time, the children were disadvantaging older people, myself included, who literally had to step over them to get where they were going. We don't really honor older people like we should. And so this is one of the reasons why we train our children to do so. The scripture obviously says in 1 Peter 2.17 that we're to honor rulers. But Peter begins by saying, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So he begins his statement by honor everyone. More about that in a moment. And notice that honoring everyone is linked to loving the brotherhood. It is linked to fearing God. And then it sort of culminates with honoring the emperor. And has been pointed out many, many times by many preachers, the emperor to whom Peter was referring was no doubt um, one of the worst people who ever lived, and that is the emperor Nero. So we have to honor even a Nero as emperor for the fact that he is emperor, and that he's been placed there by God himself. It doesn't mean that we have to honor his characteristics, but that we have to extol his sin. We honor his position. Scripture tells us that we honor church leaders. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 says, Let the elders, pastors, who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. In this passage, the word honor is linked to the concept of wages. That is, the pastor or the elder who rules well, especially one who labors in the word, is worthy of double honor. The idea being that person is worthy of uh, extra remuneration for what he does. But the principle here is not so much pay, and I'm certainly well compensated for what I do. The object here is to tell us that we're supposed to hold in high esteem those people God has placed in leadership over us within the confines of the church. It doesn't mean that the pastor has to walk around in an extremely dignified manner all the time and can't wear a golf shirt and can't go to the beach. It means, however, that we're supposed to really honor those who are laboring hard in the Word. The Scripture even goes so far as to say you should honor widows in 1 Timothy 5.3. The Apostle tells us we honor widows who are widows indeed in this New Testament economy. Being a widow was essentially to be completely destitute, particularly if a woman had no children to take care of her. So the church was supposed to honor widows and enroll them in the church so that they could receive some types of remuneration and they could serve the church. Paul says you're supposed to honor widows who are indeed widows. That is, people who are deserving of that, uh, that, um, that term because they are actually truly destitute. I point this out because honor is not something that is just a cultural phenomenon. Don't think that Paul is writing from an Eastern context that is sort of foreign to us, and therefore you're supposed to honor widows. The rest of the culture in which Paul was dealing did not honor widows. It certainly didn't honor younger people. So Paul says to Timothy, let no one despise your youthfulness. Well, it was quite common to despise someone's youthfulness. Because gospel admonition is often inherently countercultural. Certainly we're to honor other Christians. Romans 10, or Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Then he goes on to give us a very interesting phrase. Outdo one another in showing honor. If you're going to have a contest, if you're going to be in competition with a brother or sister in Christ, this is the limit. The only time you should be in, in a competition with another brother is to outdo one another by showing honor. 
We're also to honor certain God-ordained institutions, such as the Sabbath day. In Isaiah 58, 58 for example, prophet uh, speaking for God indicates that if you honor the Sabbath, God will bring about blessing. We're to honor the institution of marriage, according to Hebrews 13, 4, that it's honorable in all things. Conversely, the Bible describes certain actions as honorable or dishonorable. For example, abstaining from sexual immorality requires that we control our bodies, as the apostle says, in holiness and honor. But then there are certain kinds of sexual activities that are perverse, and that come from dishonorable passions, according to Romans 1.26. And finally, we honor those who serve Christ faithfully. And that brings us back to Philippians 2.29. Epaphroditus is worthy of honor, declares Paul. And he gives us this citation. He receives the Medal of Honor for these reasons. First, he risked his life for the gospel. On the basis of a gospel call, he made a long and dangerous journey, bringing a monetary and supplemental gift to the Apostle Paul and put his life at risk in doing so. The second element of the commendation, the citation reads, that he demonstrated true love and devotion to Christ, to Paul, and to his fellow believers at Philippi. And because he risked his life for the gospel, including being sick unto death, Paul gives four admonitions to the Philippian church when Paul says, I'm going to send him back. Paul says, receive him, receive him in the Lord, receive him with all joy, and receive him with honor. First of all, receive him. Welcome him back. He's no longer separated from you as a part of the fellowship. Welcome him back. Open your arms. Greet him with a, with a holy kiss. Give him a nice bed to sleep in. Give him his favorite food. Receive him back into your homes. But notice, as Paul often does, he doesn't leave it there. Receive him in the Lord. Receive him in the Lord has the idea that you receive him on the basis of our being in the Lord. Because we are Christ's, he is in us, we are in him. Our reception of men like Epaphroditus is done on the basis of God and his son, Jesus Christ, and Christ's lordship. In the same way, wives are supposed to obey their husbands in the Lord, in a sense, by putting yourself in a willingly submissive state to your husband, so to speak. You are actually submitting yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. You do it in the Lord. But Paul says, thirdly, receive him, receive him in the Lord, and receive him with all joy. Folks, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be joyous. Even Jesus Christ himself said that it was the joy that was set before him that allowed him to endure the cross. Our life is supposed to be, for lack of a better term, a happy life. And it's joyous in that we are happy for no earthly reason. And our joy is in the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then he says, receive him with honor. That is, you need to take time publicly as a church and honor this person. I was thinking about other men and women in the past who've been deserving of a medal of honor. And certainly, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about so many of those folks. I mentioned C.T. Studd earlier. You recall that C.T. Studd in the 19th century in Great Britain was a wealthy young man. His father was wealthy. He went to Eton. He went to Cambridge. And he was primarily known as one of the great cricket players that England ever produced. I was trying to think of a comparison. It's sort of like he was the LeBron James of cricket in the 19th century in Great Britain. He gave all that up, including his fortune, and he surrendered to the call to go to the mission field. And he spent his entire life on the mission field and actually died there in the Cameroon. And he said, I know that cricket would not last, and honor would not last. And nothing in this world would last. But it was worthwhile living for the world to come. 
his biographer, Norman Grubb, points out that in one of his last letters home, Stud wrote, as I believe I am now nearing my departure from this world, I have but a few things to rejoice in. They are these. One, that God called me to China and I went in spite of utmost opposition from all my loved ones. Two, that I joyfully acted as Christ told that rich young man to act. And we recall that he told the rich young ruler to give away all they had, take up his cross and follow Christ. Three, that I deliberately, at the call of God, went alone on the Bibby Liner in 1910, gave up my life for this work, which was to be henceforth, not for the Sudan only, but for the whole unevangelized world. My only joys, therefore, are that when God has given me a work to do, I have not refused it. People like C.T. Studd should be honored. I was privileged to conduct a funeral last week. The funeral was for Enoch Copeland. He died at the age of 100. Some of you recall that on his 100th birthday, we were in the early throes of being shut down because of the COVID crisis. His family brought him out into his front yard on Kendall Green, and there was an organized parade that went by his house with balloons, with banners, with signs, and dozens and dozens of cars, and all of his neighbors drove by and waved and shouted and blew him kisses and gave him great praise, not just because he turned 100, but because they knew his life. Enoch Copeland was a member of White Oak Baptist Church for about 53 years. He and his wife were dear, dear saints of the Lord. He lived a simple life, a life dedicated to Christ. He raised two sons who both went to seminary, one of whom spent his life on the mission field. He lived that daily, in and out, go to work, have a ministry for Christ, have a testimony at home, have a testimony to your neighbors. And when he died, his next door neighbor who had known her, known him almost all her life, gave a tearful, tearful tribute to that daily interaction with him, those times spent talking with him on the front porch, and how kind and gracious and good he was to her. That is a medal of honor. I hope we can all win it. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for men like Epaphroditus, for men like C.T. Studd, for women like Gladys Aylward, for men like Enoch Copeland. They are deserving of great praise. They are deserving of honor. And we pray that we will honor you by honoring these types of people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you all. And White Oak family, I hope to be back with you next week. And I do hope to see you soon, live and in person. God bless you all.